Before we jump into this week's episode, I wanted to hop on just prior to the intro and provide a quick content warning. This episode is going to feature some heavy topics, including references to abuse, particularly around starvation and torture performed by figures in the medical profession. While the time period has been changed, the Wilderness Heights Sanitarium was a real place, and Linda and Sam Hazard were real-life monsters. If this isn't the horror content you want, feel free to skip this episode. We'll provide a bite-sized summary of what happens in episode 18. If you want to learn more about the hazards and the victims they took advantage of, you can check out Greg Olson's book, Starvation Heights. I've also included a link with more details in the show notes. Welcome back to Spirits and Monsters of Old Seattle. We find our investigators at the Wilderness Heights Sanitarium. They are enacting a cunning plan to rescue Anne Eric's daughter, the woman afflicted with the curse of becoming a mayor. Well, we'll see how cunning the plan winds up being. We have introduced ourselves as the sister of her departed aunt, the family's doctor, and most importantly, predating actual Carl Jung's discoveries of psychoanalysis by several years, Dr. Carl Carlos Jung. Together, our brave investigators, along with Anne's fiance, Thomas Miller, have managed to, at least so far, infiltrate Wilderness Heights. They have met its eponymous owner and uh, proprietor, Linda Hazard. And at least two members of the group have realized that Dr. Hazard is dangerously sociopathic. Weirdly, this never dawned on Dr. Jensen. Don't worry about that part, it probably won't be significant. <laughs> The four of them were escorted up the stairs and were going to go and see Anne, while Dr. Hazard lagged behind a moment to briefly speak to one of her orderlies, and then quickly caught up with them. What are the four of you going to do? Do you just continue to follow the orderly? I mean, at this point, absolutely. I detect nothing wrong, and carrying myself with an air of sophistication, I will absolutely just uh, continue up and uh, assume that she is taking my offer seriously of uh, wanting to be published. Uh, the thick-necked orderly makes his way down the hall and opens the door to the upper day room and then gestures for the four of you to head inside. As he escorts us, I will just make some idle conversation. So how long have you been uh, here at the, at the sanatorium? He gives you kind of a steady, flat-eyed look and just seems about as unimpressed with you as humanly possible. That makes no sense to me. I don't understand. I know. Uh, he's non-responsive to Julian. Which I know makes no sense at all. None at all. Uh, as we come into the room, is uh, Anne in the room itself? or So the day room is a fairly large open room. Uh, there are a few desks. There are a couple of shelves containing books and magazines. There are a couple of potted plants that are in somewhat rough shape and are a little more brown than green. Uh, there are two patients who are sitting in kind of chairs off to the side. And then a young woman sitting at a table reading a magazine and kind of flipping very slowly through the pages. As the three of you kind of head in this direction, uh, Thomas looks in and suddenly gasps. Anne! 
Ing Ingrid, Anne! <gasps> and she looks, her head slowly turning. Uh, and Thomas comes rushing into the room. I feel like Julian would be a little bit proud. Thomas runs straight to her, immediately drops on one knee, dramatically takes her hands, and says, Anne, I made a terrible mistake. All I wanted to do was to marry you. And he tries to get the exact wording that he did with Julian when they were practicing at Madame Lou's. Nice. Good on you, kid. Julian just has his hands clasped in front of him and is just trying to hold back a squeal. <laughs> uh, can I get a vigilance test from everybody? Oh, no. This is going to go great. And remember, Bill, even if Roll20 says you get zero dice... You technically get one on account of your three mental conditions. Oh, boy. Uh, I have achieved one success on three dice. <sighs> Sophie got zero successes on six dice. That's how tonight's going to go, huh? Mm-hmm. Surprisingly, despite being angered, feared, and hopeless, uh... Dr. Jensen rolls three dice and gets one success. All right. The first one in two games. <laughs> so the three of you are kind of watching this scene play out as Anne is shocked at Thomas's sudden arrival and loud declarations of love. However, you take a moment to also look over at the other two patients in the room. There is a stark difference between Anne and the state that they're in. Their faces are gaunt. Uh, their arms look weak. They look in very, very rough shape. Anne, on the other hand, looks much healthier. Her skin is pale. Her hair is very blonde. Uh... Still very thick where theirs is starting to thin. She doesn't have that kind of gaunt, hungry look to her face that they do. Dear Lord. I always, I'll kind of turn to Julian with, as long as the, or, just trying to be quiet enough that Hazard or uh, the thick neck orderly can't hear us. Mm -hmm. These, these two, these two other patients are, these two poor souls look, emaciated to the point of I, I, I can't believe they're still here we need to get her out of here quickly uh, real quick question uh, for you Brian looking mm -hmm. at the screen did we just get shut in or is the door still open and we can see them out in the hallway I was wondering if anyone was going to notice that I did too Yeah. Uh, Julian turns back the door has been shut mm-hmm uh, I try to open it. It is locked. Uh, I will knock on the door. Uh, hello, Dr. Hazard. I think the, uh, the door has jammed. Uh, you don't hear a response. Is there a window in this room? I was about to ask that. There is a very, very small window. It's barely letting in enough light, which is why most of the plants in here look pretty dead. It's maybe about three feet wide and about maybe a foot high, and it's up towards the ceiling. Uh, so probably about eight feet up. Only Julian can fit through there because Sophie's books are not going through <laughs> that window. I am quite svelte. But we're also on the second floor. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, for reference purposes later in case we need it. And looks over at the group of you. Uh, who? Who are you? What is Thomas doing here? What? What is happening right now? I will look over to her and, and uh, slowly approach. Uh, hi, Anne. Uh, my name is Julian. Uh, we're f friends of Thomas. And uh, we heard there might have been some sort of a mix-up and landed you here. We were just coming to check in on you and get everything sorted out. He was quite distraught. Do I? Have we met before? 
Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've seen you around. You have. And Ingrid, it's me. And I do a little dance and kind of wiggle my fingers as if they're on a piano. Julian, I'm sorry I didn't recognize you. I There's been a lot lately. How are you? I'm... I'm somewhat unwell. That's part of why I'm here. Uh, how do you mean? I just... I couldn't manage after Aunt Johanna's death. I needed somewhere to get away from things. Thomas immediately starts launching into a tripping over himself explanation of what happened. Uh, and she's looking back and forth between him and the three of you and him and the three of you. And Thomas is desperately trying to explain all of the details of the situation that he got wrong and he totally misunderstood. Uh, like, a, uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, just uh, like the stuff that he was misled about that caused Correct. him to. Okay. Uh, he has not mentioned any of the supernatural things you have okay. told him about. Uh uh, something I just uh, realized looking at my character sheet. Apparently, I have some basic provisions equipped. Mm -hmm. You picked those up in Alala last uh, session. Okay. Oh, that's right. Okay. So, yeah, as uh, I am talking with Anne, um, if I guess if uh, Dr. Jensen is kind of checking on the patients, I will just go ahead and kind of kind of slide those over to him. They might need this. Um, yeah. Uh, I will gladly take them and start trying to hand out just small pieces of food to both the patients. Just um, here. One of the patients looks at you, eyes almost like wide and slightly feral. I, I can have this? This is for me? I, I can eat this? Slowly. Slowly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the other one is giving you kind of like a suspicious side eye. I... Don't get that anywhere near me. You're you're going to backstep all of my treatment. You need food to live. Uh, and he'll just kind of put, just not force it on, but just push, put a small piece of food in front of them, just on the table. Just please. You need to eat. The first one is trying to pace themselves. Uh, and taking a bite and waiting a second, taking a bite and waiting a second, but looks like they want to just shove this bread in their mouth as fast as they can. The other person is looking at it with a mix of hunger and disgust and self-loathing and unsteadiness. They look in rough shape. Um, Is there any, like... Uh, and I'm just, oh, I'm shooting in the dark here. Is there like a pitcher of water or anything in, in the room that I'm able to give them as well? No, well, let's say yes. Okay. Uh, there was one used for watering the plants that's still in here. Okay, so I'll try and give them a little bit, just like, again, drink slowly, mm -hmm. just slow, easy. You need to reacclimate yourself. Julian pulls out a bottle of liquor and promptly changes his mind and puts it back away. Yeah, the, save that for later, Julian. Uh, what is Sophie doing? Sophie is, uh, she's not going to uh, override what Thomas is saying, but um, mm -hmm. if there's like a lull in that conversation, um, she's going to kneel and take um, Anne's hand and just ask her if she's been treated okay and try to just check on her well-being yeah and thomas kind of makes some space for you and says and these are the people who helped me to get here and help me realize what's going on and as soon as i realized as soon as i knew i had to get here and see and make sure you're okay and and sophie here she has been doing an amazing job of taking care of all of this and helping us get here and we have two doctors with us i think at least one <laughs> bless his heart uh, and she kind of looks over at you, Sophie. None of the people here have been treated well. This is a terrible place. Do you... Are you ready to leave? I don't know if we can. 
Well, if we have anything to say about it. I mean, Sophie's still angry, so <laughs> this is definitely not helping that situation. As she says, I'm not sure if we can. Julian takes a different approach and is just kind of, you know me. We'll get out. It'll be fine. He's probably right. And has Julian told anyone that he uh, noticed the door was closed? Oh, I figured everyone had noticed it by now. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure if you were drawing attention to it. Well, he did knock and say that the door was stuck, so I'm <laughs> no, pretty fair, sure fair. we can help you. Uh, so, Anne kind of looks out at the three of you, looks to the door, looks to the other two patients. Uh, how often do they tend to come in and check on you? Uh, during the day, not very often. Uh, mostly when we need to be brought in for treatment. Which is? It varies. Sometimes ice baths for several hours at a time. Good God. <laughs> Sorry, that was Aaron, not Sophie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes what the orderlies have referred to as a massage using ship rope. Other things I'd prefer not to get into. Uh, suffice it to say, there's a reason why the treatment rooms have drains. Dear Lord. Goodness. This is reprehensible. We have to do something about this. D Dr. Jensen will look at the other two patients. Is this true? This is what you have been put through? They both kind of nod. But that one who uh, was declining food looks to you. But it's helping. We're getting better. No. H how long have you been here? I've been here for six months now. Shouldn't you be well if it was working? Oh, there's so far to go. What was she treating you for? Nerves. <laughs> A legitimate Victorian complaint. Mm -hmm. This this is preposterous. We need we need to get out of here. We need to get Anne and Thomas out of here. He'll look at the door. He'll look back at Julian. Is it locked? Uh, I'll go check. Julian fiddles with the knob. It's definitely locked. Dr. Hazard? Can you hear me? Nurses? Orderlies? Are you out there? After a moment, uh, you hear Dr. Hazard's voice from a little bit down the hall. I'm here. Dr. Jones, I'm willing to speak to Dr. Jensen. <laughs> Out of character. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, I kind of look over to, uh, to Julian, or to, to Julian, I'm Julian, uh, to Dr. Jensen, and uh, just kind of arch an eyebrow and kind of point his, you know, point towards the door she's asking for you <sighs> he'll just look to julian and sophie i don't have a good feeling about this be ready just let her know that um Anne has decided to check herself out it's a hospital right all right sophie has her hand through the pocket and on the shotgun. If I notice this, I'm like, you what? don't see that. You, it's her hands fine. are in a pocket. You don't know what's in there. You're lucky she didn't put her hand in her pocket earlier. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of my orderlies is going to unlock the door. Dr. Jensen, if you would be willing to step into the hall, but only Dr. Jensen. Dr. Jensen will kind of straighten himself up and he'll move his knuckle dusters into his uh, jacket pockets on the outside. If you wanted, you could have one hand in your pocket and have the knuckle dusters on. Not yet. Okay. All right. Uh, you hear the door unlock. Does Dr. Jensen come out? He will, uh, when he hears it unlocked, does the door open in towards us or out to the hallway? Uh, it opens out into the hallway. 
So as soon as he hears an unlock, just not like he's not trying to do it suddenly, but it's with just one big kind of purposeful just motion. Open. Just just opens the door, kind of lets it uh, open up. All right, I'm here. He'll kind of stand more in the doorway. Mm-hmm. He'll look to if if there's an if he sees the thick neck orderly. Huh. And am, am I am I seeing this correctly? There is uh, appears to be two orderlies, the doctor and a new individual mm-hmm. in the hallway. Now, as Doctor Jensen steps out into the hallway, the order. Oh yeah, Phoenix. So yeah, there is something I'd like to do if I can. So as he steps out, uh, Julian wants to. He's not going to go out. But he is going to kind of like on the inside of the uh, of the room, kind of place both hands uh, on either side of the door frame and just mm-hmm. kind of lean out a little bit. Everything OK? Step back into the room, sir. And as I do so, I'm going to try to, if I can, make a, a attempt discreetly to like get my jacket snagged mm-hmm. on like where the latch would go into the uh the bolt okay all right what Um, i was gonna do was reach in and get and tear a page out of one of my beloved books and hand to you to stick in the door so you're ahead of me (laughs) you've got books i got clothes makes sense Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh a couple of things are happening at once the orderly is trying to close the door behind dr jensen so he's out in the hallway uh, does Dr. Jensen allow that to happen? No. He'll stop the door. Hold on a second. I thought we were here to talk. What is suddenly the urgent rush here? Dr. Hazard only wants to talk to you. Great. She can. I'm here. Slow down. All right. We'll get to Julian trying to kind of wedge the door a little bit in just a second. I want to let you know what you see out in the hall there. Okay. Okay. There is a thick-necked orderly who is right behind Dr. Jensen, uh, who is trying to kind of muscle him a little bit. Dr. Hazard is a little bit further back down the hall, and then flanking her is another orderly, a lot skinnier than the other guy, and a man you haven't seen before. He is dressed in a very nice, kind of snappy-looking suit, He has a short, very kind of clipped marine style haircut. And in his hands, he has a rifle. Dr. Jensen has some military background. He spots that that is cocked and loaded. Sort of odd to have a rifle in a sanitarium, wouldn't you say, Dr. Hazard? And just from back down the hall, the man steps forward. We need it occasionally, just in case people get unruly. (laughs) You need a rifle with uh, men such as your orderly behind me here? Fascinating. Especially since your patients all seem so weak and starved. But I'm sure there's a very valid reason. Well, what did you want to talk about? And there is a valid reason that I'd like to talk to you about, Dr. Jensen. Please, if you could just step forward with me for just a moment. I will kind of look back over my shoulder at uh, Julian. Upon hearing you mention a rifle twice, uh, Julian has now gone for his pistol as well. It's it's tucked in into his vest, but... Um, this does seem strange... Uh, seeing uh, Julian kind of get his pistol ready Dr. Jensen will just kind of give him a nod alright if you wanted to discuss where are we heading given your uh, proclivity to lock your guests in rooms unannounced I'd like to know where we're going we'll stay right here Dr. Jensen I promise we won't go far I just want to be able to speak to you a man of medicine Dr. Jensen will begrudgingly take a step forward into the hall. Uh, This is a mistake, but as he does that, 
Um, Julian is also going to walk through the door uh, if, if he's able to. That guard immediately tries to shut it as soon as Dr. Jensen steps out of the uh, doorway. Uh, I will give you one of two things. You can either try and wedge that piece of cloth into uh, where the latch would go so it won't lock properly, or you could try and push your way through it. If I see that Julian is about to go out there, Sophie will like put her hand on his arm and like try to actually no, she won't because she's she's angry. Annoyed <laughs> you need both hands for her shotgun. I mean, I mean, she's not gonna like start shooting or anything right now, <laughs> but she's also not gonna probably de-escalate. Okay. Um. <laughs> so here's the thing. I have another question for you, Brian. Mm -hmm. um, mechanically, it would certainly be, uh, I mean, trying to push my way through is, is probably a non-starter. I need to get pretty lucky with the dice. In my head, what I wanted to be able to do was to try to, uh, you know, get out there and then be like, I'm sorry, I just, I was looking for the restroom. So I'm not going to be able to do that until I get through the door is, is kind of what's happening mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would give you either an agility or a force check to try and get past the guard, either kind of weaving under his arm or just pushing open the door. But yeah, I know neither both. of those is Julian Strong. They're both the same. Uh, yeah, you know, mechanically, it would be better for me to probably try wedging it. But I, I think, yeah, I'm going to go with the agility check and, and see if I can slip under his arm. Okay. You have magic dice, so it'll be fine. Mm. I mean, we'll see how that plays out. I feel like the more we call magic dice, the more they lose their luster. <laughs> I know. We're like sucking its power away. So agility, you need three dice. Mm -hmm. And the orderly is going to make an opposed force test. Oh, no. Yeah, no, that's zero successes. Oh, shit. <laughs> uh, two dice out of seven. Oh, man. So Julian goes to kind of duck under this guy's big, beefy arm but he failed to take into account the calculus of the fact that this man has two hands. <laughs> uh, and he just gets one on Julian's sculpted chest and like with a shove, Julian is pedaling back like four or five steps. Most people need to pay for that. <laughs> Door shuts and he immediately pulls out the keys and locks it. <sighs> well, now that that's settled, uh, how, I know, uh, Dr. Jensen's middle-aged. Uh, how does um, the the new gentleman in the hallway, mm -hmm. uh, how old does he look compared to uh, Dr. Jensen? Is he older or younger than Dr. Jensen? Probably close to the same. Uh, he looks a little bit younger than Dr. Jensen. Uh, maybe like five or ten years, but not by much. No, nah, it doesn't. It, as long as it can mm -hmm. be a month, that's, that's perfect enough. Dr. Jensen will turn toward the orderly then turn back to towards uh, Linda Hazard and look over her shoulder at the man holding the rifle. Well, now that you've appeared to have settled that issue, do you mind um, lowering the hammer on that rifle, kid? Son, sorry. Do you mind lowering the hammer on that rifle, son? I don't want anyone else to get hurt. <laughs> and he kind of just smirks. And looks real smug about that. I assure you, Doctor. If I need to lower the hammer, you'll know. Fantastic. I'm not worried about your hammer. I'm worried about the guns and your itchy trigger finger. It's not pointed at you yet. And yet, I don't want anyone else to get shot either by you jumping and like a scared child. Decock the hammer. Linda looks back at him and kind of gives it a nod. It's all right, Sam. Dr. Jensen is going to have a very reasonable conversation with us. Uh, and he does slowly let the hammer go on the rifle. I'm glad you see that you can do what you're told there, Sam. Pleasure to meet you. You'll look back to Dr. Hazard. What is it you would like to discuss? Dr. Jensen. I understand that you are a very learned man. You are someone who I have read some of your writings. Obviously, the Jensen name is 
quite well known in medical circles. You'll kind of be. Yeah, his mental conditions aren't great. He'll look fidgety to that comment. Yes, yes, there's my family is well known. So what does that mean for you? It means, given your background, given your family's history with medicine, you, of all people, understand what I'm doing here. You saw Anne, didn't you? I saw a poor, emaciated shell of a woman who is called Anne, yes. No, 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 Dr. Jensen. The treatment is working. Anne is as healthy now, so much more healthy than when she arrived. Her condition is improving. By the day, she is growing stronger, more fit. My treatments are working. Is now the time to tell her it's because she's sucking the life out of guys at night, or? See, now, when you say it like that, it sounds weird. Oh, yeah. I did. Yeah, it does. <laughs> My bad. Dr. Jensen, I read several reports about an effort during the war. They were about the improvements in the efficacy of ether and other forms of pain management when the body was emptied of food. Men who went without food or had it ejected from them were able to be affected by the drugs much faster and more thoroughly than those who had meals still in their stomachs. I recall reports from both sides of the battlefield, testing this technique. Hmm. Surely, you of all people see what I'm doing here is making progress. And Bill, can I get another observation roll with a plus two bonus? Okay. I think that might even give you two whole dice now. No, it gives me one. <clears throat> well, on a dice of ro- one... I did not roll a a success. She seems just very enthusiastic to talk to you about this. Show me your treatment rooms. I want to see what you're doing to these people firsthand. Of course. If these facilities match what you say. Of course, of course, Dr. Jensen, right this way. And she leads you up the upper hall towards one of the treatment rooms. Uh, she uh, unlocks the door. Mm-hmm. At, by the way, at the mention of the uh, progression of eth- use of ether, Dr. Jensen will keep a wary eye now on the how f- far away the orderlies are. He wants mm-hmm. to make sure they keep at least arm length. Excellent. Uh, the orderly, uh, that thick-necked one, doesn't follow after you. He stays by the day room door. Okay. Sam Hazard kind of waits down the hall with that rifle, uh, still loaded, but at least not immediately ready to fire. He's very closely watching what you're doing. And Linda unlocks the door to the treatment room. Here, Dr. Jensen, you, you can see the work that I'm doing. And inside is a young woman in a bathtub. Uh, the top of it has been completely secured with a large canvas wrap so that just her head is sticking out of the top. Uh, She looks at you with kind of slightly wild eyes. Can I help you? I'm in the middle of a treatment right now. Uh, Does she look particularly like gaunt in the face or does it look more like a... Yes, definitely. Okay. She looks like there are patches of hair that are falling out. Her eyes look almost, her whole face looks kind of skull-like on account of how sunken it is. Oh. Uh, Dr. Jensen will look at her. And what are you here being treated for? I am suffering from an acute case of intestinal parasites and toxins. 
My digestion has caused me to be unwell. <sighs> okay. And how long have you been here? Four weeks now. And the the parasites have not passed in this time? N not yet, but I'm making great progress. D Dr. Hazard has assured me that it's going well. Um, Dr. Jensen will turn back to Dr. Hazard. She's immediately behind you. Ugh. Well, Doctor, why don't you come and show me firsthand what your treatments have accomplished with this individual? She said that she is here for, uh, I believe you said, in intestinal bugs and issues. What what has your 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 treatment? And uh, actually, he'll turn back toward the tub uh, after hearing about what Anne had said. The modesty of the patient aside, what else is underneath that canvas stretching? Ice. Ice. To deal with the digestion. Dr. Jensen will turn back to uh, Dr. Hazard. So how does submitting someone to pneumonia and hypothermia improve their condition and make them stronger and healthier? Well, surely you must see, Dr. Jensen, how those are related. No, I see a woman here who had minor digestive issues, something that might have been solved by uh, moderate fasting and improvement of, of their diet, and instead you have decided to sub subject them to freezing temperatures? Uh, the, the woman has lost nearly all her hair. How is this an improvement to digestive issues? We are making strides. Progress one step at a time, Dr. Jensen. Surely you're not one of those medical sorts who ascribes to the phrase, do no harm. <laughs> <laughs> you must do what is necessary. How is Dr. Jensen feeling talking to Linda Hazard? Frustrated, because Dr. Jensen, especially at the the do no harm, he just there's there's both a ping of anger, um, because this is clearly doing much harm, but there is a there's also a ping of guilt. Of this um, something maybe bubbling up a little bit. Yes, that the he doesn't he doesn't disagree that sometimes to put it in medical terms, sometimes you have to re-break the bone to set the leg properly. So he understands some of this. But this is this is almost a mockery, I guess, of what he feels professionally mm -hmm. of the stance. He'll be a little bit kind of clenching his jaw. All right, doctor. So. And Bill, can I get a vigilance test from you? Oh boy. You sure can. Surprise of surprises. Out of, uh, well, it would be six dice, but I have a penalty of three. So out of three dice, I have one success. All right. Uh, so Dr. Jensen kind of takes a moment to look over the treatment room. Uh, there's this large bathtub. There is a metal table. There's a lot of medical equipment in here, and some of it he recognizes. However, some of it looks unsettling to him. He sees things that look much more like medieval implements than what he would consider medical tools. <sighs> Alright, Doctor, we've covered for lack of a better term, ice baths for intestinal issues. What about these other instruments that are you have here? Some seem adequate. 
Some seem more proper for a butcher's block. Sometimes it is necessary to help push the body in order to help get someone into a state of wellness. He takes a deep breath because he feels almost provoked. I know you understand. Oh, yes, I understand. So tell me, doctor, what does the end of the treatment look like? How do people, how, how many people have you cured of their afflictions via your treatment? Well, we're making great strides. Oh, strides. So might interpret that as none. We have had several successes. Several people who have left Wilderness Heights and gone on to be quite well. Quite well. How many? How many in the last, say, six months? Oh, at least two. Uh, and behind her, you notice Sam kind of tapping his fingers on the butt of that rifle. We're going to briefly cut back. Uh, Sophie and Julian, you've heard kind of snippets of conversation coming from down the hall. What are the two of you, Thomas and Anne, going to do? I would like to, if possible, if I need to climb on a chair or a table or something to see mm -hmm. what is outside the window and also determine um, how the window could open. Mm -hmm. uh, you are able to kind of push a table over and then stack a chair on top of that and then kind of clamber up that. Oh, boy. The window could be pushed outwards, uh, but it's sort of like one of those school windows that can only extend so far. Mm -hmm. You might be able to like snap it if you had the right tools to kind of break through it, like a crowbar or something heavy. You might be able could to try I use and just... the mm -hmm. butt of the shotgun to like... Yep, that could probably do it. Uh, and you're able to push it up enough so you can kind of just barely see outside. You're not quite able to fit through it yet because you haven't used the shotgun to kind of break through the latches on it. Sure. But it drops just straight down to the ground below. Uh, and it's hard to estimate how far it is given the way the fog is swirling around. Mm, okay. I guess if you're doing that, Julian will attempt to provide some audio cover for Sophie. And he's just going to drum out a rhythm on the door. Just trying to annoy the orderly on the other side? Pretty much. <laughs> Maybe he'll get so annoyed that he decides to come in. That would be bad if Sophie's trying an escape method. Well, yeah. Uh, so Anne and Thomas are doing everything they can to just hold stuff steady for you, Aaron. Uh, so Sophie's able to stand up there pretty confidently. Okay. But it is a ways down. Are there any, so we had two people sitting and then there's a table mm -hmm. and there's obviously the chair that I'm on. Yep. So there's three chairs. Now there, let's say there's four chairs in here. Are there any textiles in here? Mm, what are you thinking? Like, this isn't a private room. It's like a sitting room. So there's mm -hmm. no bed or bed sheets. Um, are there any curtains or um i mean really curtains is the only thing i can think of uh not given the way this particular window is right okay you could say the uh table has tablecloth on it though do i think that the tablecloth would support anyone definitely yorts everyone else is a little bit more questionable okay well yorts is the only one i care about so the mm -hmm. question answered yep just Got to papoose him and then jump out the window. Right. Okay. Got it. Um. He'll be fine. You'll land on his feet. Yeah, he'll be That's fine. That's how cats work. Um. Yeah, I mean, to me, gosh, to me, getting Anne and Thomas out of here is the number one priority, and someone being able to break her curse theoretically thomas but if she like do we think 
if he's proposed to her now, he has to propose to her when she's in the mare form, right? Mm-hmm. And he knows all this. I assume you have shared all this with him. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we told him all the details of everything. Yep. So theoretically, if he and and Anne get out, then they have a good chance to break her curse and she's not going to kill him because he's going to pr- propose to her. That one you're not 100% sure on. No, but there's, I mean, it's, you know, it's a possibility. It's not like mm-hmm. a super slim chance. Yep. I mean, ideally, we also get out so that we can help him do that, but they are the first ones that I would like to get out. Will will both of them fit through this window if we have a plan to to do that, just like logistically or geometrically, will they fit through the window? Uh, if you were to break the hinges that kind of let yeah. it stick out, uh, it okay. probably could open wide enough that a person might be able to crawl through. Okay. All right. Um... I think almost every player just yawned at the same time. <laughs> They're contagious. Yeah, I just, I, I don't, guys, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. You got the Sophie. All right, while Sophie is plotting uh, and Julian is drumming, we will cut back to Dr. Jensen. Linda looks at you almost somewhat expectantly. So Dr. Jensen will kind of take a deep breath. He's not happy about what's going on and what he feels like is a perversion of some of his medical practices, but he's got to roll with this. So, all right, doctor. So you've explained your treatments. I'm a, are there any other steps to this treatment? Is it, is it, uh, the massages, the ice baths, the cleansing and the fasting. The cleansing. What do you what do you do for the cleansing? You know how that works, Doctor. Mm. Right. Fine. So then tell me of your refinement. How have you how have you honed your process, improved it? This woman's here been here for six months, and she looks aghast. We are seeing real progress with Anne. Oh, we are refining our technique on what we're doing with Anne. If only they knew. Oh, and what are you doing different with her? We are trying several different alterations on frequency of technique, on application. We're finding that Anne is growing stronger by the day. Her nervousness, her grief that she was experiencing is passing. Grief passes with time, Doctor. I would expect you, of all people, to know this. For some, and for some, it lingers. Give me, give me, give me proof. You've seen her with your eyes, Dr. Jensen. I've seen her. You said you've changed the the status for her. This is science, madam. I would expect you to know this. Who else have you tried these treatments on? Have they shown similar improvements? Or has it just been... Our dear Anne. We are working on refining the technique. That is part of why I wanted to talk to you. Without the company that you currently have. I believe that we are making real strides here. Which could be bettered by the addition of your keen medical mind. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> you. Uh, and just behind her, you hear Sam kind of scoff. <laughs> Dr. Jensen will let out a laugh. <laughs> so now you try flattery, dear, my dear doctor. I don't think your counterpart in the hallway with the itchy trigger finger seems to agree with you. Is that right, Sam? I don't think we need you one little bit. <laughs> At least someone here speaks the full truth, the plain truth. All right, Doctor. What would you propose I add to this endeavor of yours? Why, your wealth of knowledge, of course. 
I have had some experience, but it pales in comparison to what one finds out in the world in different conditions. In places where there are fewer questions on what one has to do for the sake of the medicine. <sighs> Frankly, Doctor, I'm, I'm disappointed. I had thought maybe, maybe, if someone is speaking as you are of doing what's needed to be done for medicine to improve the lives of others, and yet you seem to be going about this like a child in a puddle of mud splashing about. You have no, you have no scientific inquiry. You have no uh, hypothesis or validation. You're just starving these people without and with, based on things that you've read that you clearly do not understand. If I came here, do you realize what would happen? There wouldn't be a Dr. Hazard. There would just be Dr. Jensen. I, I, I am just, I, I am shocked that, I am shocked and disappointed that someone else who would call themselves the prestigious title of doctor goes about it so haphazardly. I'm terribly sorry you feel that way. Very well, then. I would like you to return to the day room, Dr. Jensen. We will sort something out. Um. So, in, uh, Brian, in the room, in uh, I'm assuming we're in uh, a treatment room. It is myself, the Dr. Hazard, um, one uh, of the so orderly kind of like standing outside of it. Ah, okay. So right here. Okay. Hmm. And then, okay. Uh, my question was going to be, what time is it at this point? Mm -hmm. Uh, you got out here in the morning. So at this point, uh, it's probably about nine o'clock, maybe 10. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. You know what? Let's go rejoin. Let's go rejoin my friends. I'd I'd actually like to go take another look at Anne to see your your progress with your treatments. Now that I have a much better understanding of your <sighs> methodologies. Of course, Dr. Jensen. Uh and she and the orderly lead you back down the hall. Julian, as you are kind of drumming away, there are several loud raps. On the door. Stand back. Uh, <clears throat> why are you coming in to see me? Have you finally decided that it's time for us to get better acquainted? You're about to get better acquainted with a blackjack if you don't stand back. Um, as he is saying this, is Sophie is still trying to do something. Uh, no, I was getting, I, I was talking, but I was muted. Um. <laughs> I I'm was going to try to that, signal her, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I'm assuming that Julian has heard, you know, at least some in, inclination of where the uh, conversation was going. So Sophie would have gotten down and put the chair back and stuff. Sounds good. Does Julian kind of back up from the door? Uh, he'll back up from the door. You will not be featured at the post intelligence, sir. <laughs> 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 all right and dr jensen you are escorted back into the day room unless you try and fight your way out of that um so say i'm um, okay so i'm assuming as we're walking down it'd be sam hazard is staying behind right where he is yep okay. i'm assuming that linda hazard is in front along with the other orderly uh, Linda actually stays back in the upper hall, and the skinny orderly is the one who escorts you down into the middle hall, unless you uh, do not go. So I would wait for her. So I would, mm -hmm. if, if, I, if the orderly starts walking down, I'd stop, I'd stop looking expectantly at her. After you, Doctor. Why well, are you not coming? No. No? So, why not? You've given me quite a bit to think about, Dr. Jensen. I need to... Revise my treatment plan for Anne. I'll bring something up to you later tonight to get your thoughts on it. Later tonight? 
She's a slow writer. Okay, but why does she think we'll be there? <clears throat> Dr. Jensen, I kind of at the mention of later tonight, dear doctor, if we're still here and, and it's and the sun has gone down, we're not the ones you need to worry about. <laughs> she looks puzzled by that, but doesn't ask about it. He will walk by, stop for a moment, take a look at Sam. Uh, how does Sam hold himself? Like a Marine. Interesting. You mentioned earlier about an itchy trigger finger. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Jensen's pretty knowledgeable. This guy has actual trigger discipline on that Springfield rifle that he's holding. R- right. It was it, the, the trigger finger was more just to... Um, Taunt him? Just to rile him. him. Yeah, rile him up, yeah. He's mm-hmm. like, he'll, he'll stop, give him kind of once up. <sighs> it's always a shame when a soldier makes a terrible choice. I could not agree more. Mm. He will follow the orderly until he uh, he ha- Dr. Jensen has an idea, but he's waiting for the door to be unlocked and opened. Okay. Uh, the thick-necked orderly unlocks it uh, after threatening Julian uh, and opens it up once Dr. Jensen is in the middle hall. Okay. Oh, God. Bill, is it about to pop off? It might be about to pop off. Oh, no. I was going to say that I think our best idea is to bide our time and wait for her to turn. And then have Thomas be like, propose to her really quickly and then tell her to eat all these other people. But I don't know if that would work. I guess. um, That's a good. Oh, that's a good question. Dr. Jensen does not want to be here. He doesn't want to be with this quack of a lady. Uh. He is somewhat concerned for the rifle, but there are orderlies here that he might be able to hide behind, even temporarily. Um, If the door gets opened, is Julian kind of just standing on the other side, um, visible, like, uh, from the hallway? Uh, He'd be visible. He's not hiding behind, like, the the wall or anything. But he did back up a little, right? He did back up, yeah. Okay. So... I'll move him on uh, map to say maybe there. You notice that that thick-necked orderly has pulled out a blackjack, uh, which is basically like a heavy-weighted uh, sap that you could hit somebody with. Yeah. Uh, he will, I guess, Dr. Lucius will look in at Julian, um, and I guess he'll be looking at Julian to see if Julian, does Julian look like he is try, like anxious, like trying to get out? So maybe popping off should happen or is this more of um we're trying to be quiet because sophie was doing something julian does not look he might look a little bit anxious he does not look anxious to get out he is trying to just main his cool facade all right dr jensen will allow himself to be led back in all right and once you're in the orderly Gives Julian a little bit of a look, uh, then closes the door and relocks it. I um, pantomime writing something down and then like wagging my finger at him. Uh, Can I get vigilance tests from the three of you? Uh, So Sophie got one success on six dice. So one success on six dice. Uh, Phoenix and Bill, how'd you do? Uh, I got zero successes on three dice. The magical GM dice have forsaken me. No. Uh, Dr. Lucius, shockingly, got two successes on three dice. All right. So Julian is much too into his pantomime to be able to pay attention to what's going on in the hallway. Accurate. But Sophie and Dr. Jensen are able to just barely catch details. Dr. Jensen a little more clearly of Sam and Linda talking and mentioning they'll need to draw up some intake paperwork. Jesus Christ. (sighs) Fantastic. And, Bill, you can definitely hear Sam Hazard smugly say, we can deal with them. I know just the spot to bring them out to the woods. Wow. Fantastic. The three of you look at one another and then back towards Anne, sitting in the corner of the room with Thomas. 
she doesn't know it, but you are sitting with a supernatural time bomb that is going to go off if you aren't careful, potentially killing you, the innocent patients, and maybe even the two of them. Summer days in Seattle are long. Are they long enough to come up with a plan to get you out and somewhere safe before Anne transforms? We'll find out next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Spirits and Monsters of Old Seattle. Our theme song is Myths and Legends by Robert Bruckmeyer, which is playing right now. Our music is by Andreas Lundstrom, and you can hear more of his work on the Sweden Rolls podcast. Link in the show notes. Our editor is Hannah Cheney. If you're enjoying this show, please take two minutes to rate and leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get podcasts. I know every podcast says it, but it really does make a difference and helps us continue to grow the show. Finally, remember the motto of the library. Fear gives way to knowledge. Knowledge gives way to wisdom. And wisdom gives way to the truth. Until next time.